Okay, just a couple of uh, comments about the Learn Smart. Um, if you saw the, uh, the message that I put on the web page and on uh, the Blackboard page, um, I had to essentially delete the assignment and resync it um, because there were some problems with some students were having with it. And I think it should be working okay. I'm seeing the score showing up in, in Blackboard again for that uh, Learn Smart for Chapter 10. Uh, it is active until this evening. If you had completed it before Monday, or before Monday afternoon when we did this, um, if you haven't gone back into it, please do just to make sure it syncs properly tonight. Just All you need to do is enter the assignment. It'll probably say you haven't done anything. Uh, some people are saying that, but I've seen the scores. So it should be okay, just ignore that, but at least activate that assignment one more time if you've completed it before Monday afternoon. Um, for the rest of you, I think it should be okay. If you do have any problems with the Chapter 10 Learn Smart uh, points showing up, let me know and I'll try to track that down. Uh, but it should end up in Blackboard at the end. Uh, Learn Smart for Chapter 11 has been activated, so that's ready to go. Um, I also uh, want your help too because uh, I put up an online survey form for this class with questions about all aspects of this from uh, the lectures to the videos to the um, SI sessions um, and the homework system. So I would really appreciate your feedback on all that so that we can improve this course in the future. So if you would take a look at it, there's links all over the um, web page and there's um, an announcement on the Blackboard site as well with a link to the online survey. Okay, uh, we're going to talk about chapter 11 today. Start talking about aerines and aromaticity. And there are some special kinds of compounds uh, since we've just talked about conjugated systems with um, uh, like 1, 3 dienes and uh, the fact that they do some different chemistry because they are conjugated and they have some extra stability because they are conjugated, there's something that actually uh, creates a, another situation in terms of stability and reactivity when you start to put conjugated systems into rings. And uh, benzene is one example of a molecule which does that. And so we've, we've, we've seen these six-membered rings with three double bonds before. Uh, but we haven't really talked about their properties, their stability, and the kind of reactions that they undergo. Because it is different than typical alkenes, and it's uh, a little bit different than even conjugated dyeing systems. Um, here are just some examples of aromatic compounds. They're referred to as aromatic compounds, or arenes, uh, for historical reasons, because a lot of them that were isolated were isolated from um, natural materials, and they have um, a lot of aromatic properties to them. For example, benzaldehyde. Benzaldehyde is a molecule with a benzene ring and a, a C double bond O with an H. Uh, this has an odor of um, almonds, so you have this almond smell. <clears throat> Cinnamaldehyde, guess where that comes from? Cinnamon. So it's the, it's the odor of cinnamon, and actually if you have artificial cinnamon, this is the compound they use to flavor that. Um, so you can see they're very aromatic. There are tons and tons and tons of common names which are accepted uses uh, for compounds based off of the benzene ring. So for example, hydroxybenzene is called phenol. The amino benzene is called aniline. And a lot of these uh, uh, names are very much common names, but they have been integrated with the aromatic chemistry, been integrated into the IUPAC menu systems. So when we talk about the molecule toluene, for example, toluene is a benzene ring with a CH3. That word, toluene, encompasses all of that. And so we use toluene as a parent name for a molecule. Let's say there are other things on the toluene. Uh, that includes the CH3. Xylenes have two CH3 groups on the benzene. Uh, we can have these rings fused together, like in naphthalene. Of course, naphthalene, you know what naphthalene is, right? Naphthalene? Maybe it's not used that much anymore. Mothballs? Has anyone ever smelled a mothball? That's naphthalene. It's pure naphthalene. Um, they can be a larger aromatic compounds. We'll talk a little bit more about uh, various kinds of aromatic compounds, but polyaromatic hydrocarbons, where all the rings are sort of fused together. Um, these are actually, a lot of these are carcinogens, so um, there's a little note there. If anyone smokes, this is what you're putting into your lungs, and it oxidizes and then intercalates into your DNA, and then causes mutations. So 
Now you know, um, so quit. I think some of these compounds also, well, let's say, when you, when you grill your hamburger, okay, you get that black char on it, guess what? Some polyaromatic hydrocarbons. So even uh, grilling meats can be a problem, but I'm not giving that up. <laughs> uh, okay, well, let's talk about benzene. Benzene has a really interesting history, and, and there's a lot of folklore around how people thought about benzene structure. Um, the original isolation of benzene, just the C6H6 molecule, uh, actually was from distilling what was the energy source at that time. This is before petroleum, okay? This is before oil. How did they light their candles or light their lamps? They used oil from whales, so whale fishing. And they distilled the whale oil and got out this molecule. Um, and again, without a good idea about chemical structure and bonding back in the 19th century, uh, people didn't really know what the structure was. But eventually it was determined that the benzene molecule had a molecular formula or an empirical formula of C, one carbon for every hydrogen. Okay, and then it was further determined that the molecular formula for benzene was C6H6. Pretty interesting molecule, right? What's the general formula for a saturated alkane? And I'm going way back in the class now. Saturated alkane. CNH2N plus 2. Okay? For an alkene, it's CNH2N. That's still a lot of hydrogens for every carbon, right? Um, but this is a molecule which is lacking a lot of hydrogens. It's highly unsaturated. And so we know after talking about alkene chemistry and diene chemistry, that these things are pretty reactive, right? There's a lot of reactive functionality. The other thing that was determined is that all the carbons and hydrogens were equivalent. So the molecule was very, very symmetric. And some of the early ideas about that uh, were kind of based on its reactivity. So here you have a highly unsaturated molecule. We know, for example, that, uh, did my pen come up? Okay, we know, for example, that if you take a double bond and add Br2 to it, okay, what do you get? You form the addition of bromine to that alkene. Right? <coughs> Chemistry you should all know very well by now. But this molecule, C6H6, if you were to do the same reaction with bromine, and you have high unsaturation, you would expect to get out a molecule that was C6H6Br2. Okay? But when they just react this with bromine, there's no reaction. No reaction at all. Which is what's surprising to the early people who were investigating this. They found, however, that when they added a catalyst, C6H6, and they added bromine with a catalyst, the Lewis acid like iron tribromide, okay, only in the presence of catalyst did they get a, a product. And it was C6H5Br plus a molecule of HBr. What kind of reaction is that? General reaction type. A substitution, right. We substituted one of the hydrogens for a bromine. Notice the molecule is still as unsaturated as it was before. So whatever the unsaturation is, it wasn't reactive in the normal way. Okay, and that's, that's somewhat interesting. Um, some of the early structures people were thinking about. Well, C6H6, how many ways could you put that together? Uh, ideas like in this, this highly compact prismane structure. Actually, that would solve some of the problems. There are no pi bonds in it in this particular structure, but all the carbons and all the hydrogens would be symmetric. Or they'd be a completely symmetric molecule. Um, so that's not unreasonable to think of it as this. Uh, if it doesn't have uh, double bonds for bromine to react with, that might make sense, right? Based on the evidence that they had at that time. Uh, here's another one, Dewar benzene. It's, um, a, a guy named Dewar came up with this structure, but that doesn't really fit because it turns out that um, you have 
highly, you have double bonds there, which could be reactive. You have not all the carbons and hydrogens being equivalent. Okay, some are on a double bonded carbon, some are on a single bonded carbon, sp3. So that didn't really make sense. Um, and there was a, a guy named Kekele who uh, thought about the structure and thought, well, maybe it's a combination of alternating rings. It was pretty close, pretty close idea to the structure. And the folklore is that one night he had a dream about, what is it, a snake chasing its tail and then biting its tail, and he thought, ah, it must be a ring compound. Um, I don't know if that's true. I haven't really found a source that says that's absolutely true, but they feel, in every textbook, I think they talk about that, that story. <laughs> Makes for a nice story. Uh, but what Kekulé thought about was that, well, maybe the molecule uh, has three alternating double bonds, and they quickly interconvert from the, in the positions, okay? So they're, they're moving. And that was his idea. Uh, so that would be an equilibrium, the positions of the, of the um, double bonds. But now we know, we have a much better idea about structure and bonding. We have quantum mechanics, which lets us describe mathematically what molecular orbitals look like. We talked about that uh, last time, right? Uh, and we know that when double bonds are adjacent to each other like this, alternating double single bonds, that they are all in conjugation. Okay? Um, if it were Kekulé's structure, we would have alternating single and double bonds. And if that were the case, the bond lengths would be different. Okay, a single bond is longer than a double bond. So if Kekulé were correct, uh, we would have longer and shorter bonds alternating around this ring. Um, in fact, it, it, we know now that benzene is symmetric, all the bonds are identical, about 1.4 angstroms in, in length. And so there is no single bond or double bond. It's actually between every carbon, there's like a bond and a half, really. And what really is describing these two structures is not in equilibrium between alternating double bonds. They're just resonance forms. Okay? We know resonance now. We know conjugation. We know that if we have a p orbital on every carbon, the electrons are actually just spread out evenly throughout that whole pi system. And that describes benzene. As a matter of fact, you often see benzene written not with the, the individual double bonds, because that just represents one of the possible resonance structures, but with a circle in it, recognizing that there's a complete pi system in that ring. Okay, so you expect that conjugation of all those double bonds in a ring would lead to some extra stability. Uh, if you do look at the electron density, here's the uh, electron density map for benzene, and you can see that the pi system that's above and below the plane of this benzene ring um, is where the electron density is. Okay, as we expect, just like when we look at a double bond, any pi bond, there's electron density in that pi bond. But for some reason, these are extra stable. They don't react under the normal alkene-like reactions, at least not apparently. So how stable is it? Uh, now, we, I think we've seen some of these examples where I did hydrogenation of alkenes with benzene rings present, but I didn't really explain that that's something which doesn't get hydrogenated under normal conditions. So if you just have an alkene with hydrogen and palladium on carbon, right, you, you'd add hydrogen to the double bond. But this is unreactive. And it takes an awful lot of energy to get them to react. So usually they require very reactive catalysts um, and high temperatures and high pressures to get those double bonds to be hydrogenated because it's very, very stable. Um, so if you use nickel for a catalyst, 100 to 200 degrees Celsius, 100 atmospheres of pressure, so 100 times Earth atmosphere of pressure of hydrogen gas, only then can you really force it to be hydrogenated. So it's not that you can't react. It's just that because the molecule is so stable, it's going to take a lot more energy to do reactions on it. A lot stronger conditions. Okay, well, if you think about 
uh, the energy you might expect from that system. So here is uh, the hydrogenation, the heats of hydrogenation. All of these are isomers that if you were to hydrogenate would make the same cyclohexane so we can directly compare their energies. And so what we have here, uh, if you just look at the energy of a single double bond, if you add hydrogen to cyclohexene, uh, that um, releases 120, I think these are kilojoules, 120 kilojoules per mole when you hydrogenate that. So if you have two double bonds, you would expect that to be double, right? 100 or 240. Uh, and so what we see here is cyclohexadiene, cyclohexadiene is close to 240, but a little less. So 240. You know, if you go from here, it might be 240, right? But it's a little bit more stable than that, okay? And why is that? The conjugation, right? So the diene of 1,3-cyclohexadiene gets a little bit of stability from conjugation. So if you had a third double bond, wouldn't you expect it to be higher? But maybe you still get some stability from the conjugation. So if it were just Three, the enthalpies of three double bonds added together, you should have somewhere up here at 360. Okay, so theoretically, benzene should be at that high or, or maybe a little lower. Okay. In fact, what happens is benzene is even more stable than the diene with three of the double bonds. Benzene is actually here, 208 kilojoules per mole to hydrogenate all three double bonds. Okay, so that's, that's an awful lot of extra stability that's not just explained by what we've seen so far for conjugation, right? How do we explain that? Well, it, it actually turns out that that stability uh, comes from the fact that it is in a ring, okay? So if you had three double bonds in a row without the ring, you might be somewhere up in this region for the energy. But once you tie it into a ring, that makes a situation where we have a special case that we get extra stability, and those are the types of molecules which we refer to as aromatic molecules. We have this aromatic stabilization um, and aromatic or arene functionality and stability. Okay, and, and benzene is the, the simplest one, the all-carbon one. Uh, there are certainly lots of variants of aromatic compounds uh, and different size rings, but there, there is a little bit more to it than that. Um, I just remind you what we talked about uh, at the last uh, class when we were talking about diene molecular hormones, and all I want to focus on is the fact that, let's say if you take something like butadiene, 1,3-butadiene, we have, in the calculations of those molecular orbitals, if we start with four p orbitals to start with, they combine together to form four molecular orbitals at four different energies. Okay? All the electrons fill the lower energy ones, those are the bonding orbitals, and the ones up there are the antibonding orbitals. And based on the symmetry of the signs of the conjugated p orbitals, uh, just remember that what we see is that at the, at the lowest level, there are no nodes, zero nodes, no breaks in the signs. We go up one, and there's one point or one node where the signs switch. You go up to the next level, and there are two nodes. And you go up to the highest level, there are three nodes. And if you had another double bond added to that, let's say you had three double bonds in a row, you would have then a total of six energy levels and six molecular orbitals. And notice each one gets progressively higher in energy. And then you'd have one, zero, one, two, three, four, and five nodes. Okay, so what's special about having that in a ring? Well, here are the molecular orbitals for benzene. And what we see when we think about benzene, this is the figure right from your book, when we think about benzene, uh, we have 
six p orbitals originally in the individual carbons, and when they're all together, that should combine to make six molecular orbitals. So you see six molecular orbitals here, but there's only four energy levels. Okay, that's because the molecule is a ring, and that adds additional symmetry. Okay, so if you think about uh, the molecular orbitals where the signs have zero nodes, that's the lowest energy, that's what you see on the bottom, okay? And then because the, the molecule's in a ring, there are actually two ways you could have those molecular orbitals with only one node, only one break, you know, here, between the signs. Okay, and that's again, the calculations, the quantum mechanics tells us that there are two orbitals that have degenerate by the same energy. Okay, so one's not higher than the other. Okay, and then the same case when we have two nodes, there are two degenerate ones, and then one at the top with all those. Okay, one thing I want you to notice here, um, when we think about aromatic molecules, and we're going to uh, see a little bit more details of this in a minute, notice that if we have a six-numbered ring, let me just draw a six-numbered benzene ring. Okay, there's a six-numbered benzene ring. The molecular orbital picture, this is a, new, uh, a nice pneumatic way to think about this, um, Notice that the molecular orbital array of energies matches the carbons of the ring when you put one on the bottom here. And so that looks like the six-membered ring. That's a way to remember that the orbitals have levels which are the same in energy. And notice all of the six electrons that are in this benzene ring with three double bonds in it, three pi bonds, are all in the bonding lower energy ones. Okay. That's when we have an aromatic stabilization. Because of that degeneracy of those energy levels, you overall have a much lower situation than you would if it were just an open chain without that symmetry. So that's a, uh, maybe a little bit confusing, but um, this is what we see in molecules that have aromatic stabilization. Okay, I want to come back to this uh, again and talk a little bit more about how we name them. I told you that there's a lot of common names. A lot of these are probably use, useful to remember, like benzoic acid, toluene, phenol, um, benzaldehyde. You should have a good idea about what those names mean and the structure. Um, lots of names for monosubstituted benzene rings. Okay, there are some common names for disubstitute, particularly the xyrenes. Um, but according to IUPAC, there's also another way to name these. Uh, for example, if you look at the molecule toluene, toluene is the name for the molecule which encompasses one methyl group on a benzene ring. You could also call this molecule methyl benzene. Not too surprising, right? Benzene is the six-membered ring. It has a methyl substituent on it. Benzene is the parent name, and methyl is the substituent. Okay, you could use the name toluene, which incorporates the methyl into what we refer to as the parent also. Um, so it's not that difficult uh, to think about the naming rules. Bromobenzene, uh, this is a nitro group, so it's nitrobenzene. Hydroxybenzene. Um, has the common name phenol. Um, and we have some special indicators to talk about the positions, but uh, I need to caution you that uh, these descriptors for disubstituted benzene rings are only referring to disubstituted. If you have three groups on there, you can no longer use these. So if you look at this molecule, 1,2-dimethylbenzene, okay? 1,2-dimethylbenzene. You have a methyl group in the 1 position, a methyl group in the 2 position. So that name is perfectly fine. Uh, but there are three isomers of, the, of dimethylbenzene. You can have them in the 1 and 3 position, or the 1 and 4 position. 
<laughs> if we use the common name for dimethylbenzene, the name xylene, there's a descriptor we used to indicate the, the, the um, substituent numbering without using numbers. So you'll notice here, there's a little uh, symbol O, and here's an M, and here's a P. That stands for ortho, meta, and para substituted. And it's not just for xylenes, it's any di-substituted benzene. We can use this instead of the number. Why do we have this for di-substituted benzenes? I don't know. Because when we go to a tri-substituted benzene, you don't use anything like this, you use numbers. So if you have more than two, you have to use numbers. But this is very commonly used, um, ortho, meta, para, to talk about two positions on a benzene ring in a relationship. Okay, one, two, one, three, and one, four. Okay, so not just for xylenes, uh, that's used for other molecules as well. Oops, I made a mark. So paranitrobenzaldehyde. When you think about that name, benzaldehyde is the parent. Okay, that's the parent molecule. So what does benzaldehyde look like? Benzaldehyde has a a CHO group, one carbon, one oxygen, one hydrogen. That's benzaldehyde. But now we have a second substituent. We have a nitro group. And the nitro group is in the para position. So para referring to this being the one position. Okay. So para refers to four. So if this is if this benzaldehyde is attached on one, we have to put the nitro group here on the four. So that's para nitro benzaldehyde. Orthodifluorobenzene. Benzene has two fluorine groups, uh, and ortho means they're in the one and two position. So wherever you start on this ring, if I put a fluorine here, I could put the second one here. It just happens that they're adjacent on one and two. Okay. And again, any two substituents, you could use these descriptors instead of numbers. Uh, now here's a molecule which uh, is commonly referred to as TNT, um, stands for 2,4,6-trinitro-toluene. So notice the, the parent name for this is toluene. So what does toluene look like? Toluene? Is a benzene ring with one methyl group. Okay, that's toluene. So that that methyl group is included in the parent name toluene. Okay, so remember that. And that toluene, when you use the name toluene, where the methyl is attached is carbon one. So we have carbon two, four, and six as we go around here, and there are nitro groups. And O2 groups on all of those carbons. So that's the explosive. Um, that's pretty dangerous. So you don't want to handle it, especially not in the lab here. We won't let you do that. Uh, there are more explosive things, but nitro compounds tend to be high, have a lot of energy in them, and so they tend to be very useful for explosives. Okay, how would you name this molecule? There are several ways you could name this molecule. Okay, if you just use completely IUPAC, uh, halogens, maybe you might give preference to the halogen, right? I guess you could start one, three, four. You could say one bromo. Uh, three isopropyl, or you could use the more complex name, I'm not going to. 
isopropyl 4 methyl benzene. Okay, that means benzene is the parent. Okay, that's a perfectly acceptable name. Okay, but sometimes people might refer to this as a toluene. So instead of using the benzene as the, as the parent, okay, we would use this plus the methyl group as the parent molecule. All right, so toluene as the parent name. And then, of course, that makes this number one. So it would be 4-bromo, 2-isopropyl, toluene. Okay. Uh, for me, I don't care if you use this or this, as long as you make sure that you wouldn't include a methyl group when you also when you um, do the, use the toluene. I'm not that picky about numbers. I know there are, there are very specific rules about numbering and priorities and lowest number. If you can draw the molecule from the name, I'm pretty happy with that. Um, okay, so that's a little bit about naming. Other than that, I don't think it's, there's not much more. The new aspect here is just common names and this ortho meta para designation. And I will be using that when we talk about reactions in chemistry of benzene. Okay, uh, benzene sometimes is used as a substituent on larger molecules. So if benzene, if the benzene ring is not the parent molecule, uh, we refer to it as a phenyl substituent, a phenyl. So you see here, if you have a carbon chain which is more than six carbons, okay, like an octane, we need to name the benzene ring as a substituent, so we refer to that as a phenyl group. So 4-phenyl-octane. Um, and us lazy organic chemists don't always like to write out that ring, so we often abbreviate that with a capital P and small h. That refers to a phenyl group. Okay, so That's just a benzene ring, a phenyl group. Okay. And one other substituent name. Uh, remember we talked about alkenes as a substituent on something, or the position of groups, so, right, these are allylic positions. Allylic hydrogens, right? And I said that if it's next to a benzene ring, it's a benzylic hydrogen. We use this term benzylic hydrogen. Well, if this is a substituent on a larger molecule, including a CH2 group, and then it's attached to something else, we refer to that as a benzyl substituent. That name, and this is a point of confusion, it's not just the benzene ring. When we use that for a substituent name, it includes the benzene and a CH2 group. Okay? Just like if I were to say, let, let's say I draw this molecule. Okay? How would you name that molecule? I would call it allyl benzene. Notice allyl includes the double bond carbons and the CH2 next to it. So there's the substituent attachment. That's an allyl group. This is a benzyl group. Okay? All right, any questions on naming? Um, polyaromatic hydrocarbons, that's a lot. I don't want to spend a whole lot of time on this, but I do want to point out uh, that uh, when we draw these, um, you'll notice for the molecule naphthalene that I have here, where we have two aromatic rings connected together, what I've drawn is one resonance form. Notice that there are two rings, okay? You'll notice that this one is drawn with the double bonds in these positions. So this is aromatic, the way it's written. But this one doesn't look like it has three double bonds in it, right? So that aromatic stability doesn't look quite good there. But keep in mind, if we, we can draw three resonance forms for this. 
If I move these bonds over, draw the resonance form for that, okay, now both rings have three double bonds in it, okay, this one in between is on both of them. So both of them have three double bonds in it. And then I could uh, draw them, I could draw the other side this way. Okay. So there are multiple uh, resonance forms that you can draw for the positions of the double bonds in these polyaromatic hydrocarbons. Um, some of them allow you to get situations where both of the all of the rings in there have, um, if you count that particular resonance form, have three double bonds in it, every ring. Okay. This one, anthracene. There is no resonance form where you, well, I guess there is. No, there is no resonance form where you can put three double bonds all in one ring. Okay, we can do this one. Uh, sorry, I messed that up. Oops. Can't draw today. All right. Okay, we can draw that. Right, so what I've done is shift these, okay. But if you try to shift this one down here, okay, that goes there and that goes there, um, that makes the situation where we have the middle one being, quote, aromatic. It has three double bonds. This one does not, and this one does not. And so if you draw all of these resonance forms, what you find is that not you can't draw all three of them with aromatic rings at the same time. Anthracene actually tends to be a little more reactive than just benzene or naphthalene. Um, and I'm not going to worry about the chemistry of these polyaromatic hydrocarbons. Your book does go through some examples if you're interested. Um, you can take a look at that, but I'm not going to worry about that for this class. Um, but they do, they tend to have a little bit more reactivity. I just want to share three things before we go, which is kind of cool. So I have one minute. Buckminster fullerene is an all aromatic compound. These are allotropes of carbon. Um, although they're bent, these are all aromatic, aromatic carbons. And you can have these in balls like this, which we refer to as a bucky ball. You can have them in sheets. This is graphene. It's a single atomic thickness sheet of graphite. Um, they're all aromatic carbon forms of carbon. Um, and if those curl around, they can actually curl around and form tubes, nanotubes. These types of carbon-based aromatic compounds are nano in the nanometer range usually. They're nanomaterials, and they're very, very important for lots of materials applications. So if you're interested in uh, new solar cell energy technology or very hard materials, this is what uh, is really exciting in terms of research. For those. Okay, we're going to talk about some of the chemistry of benzene rings um, in the next class, and so we'll see you on Friday.